Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hi. Great. American audience has never answered, so that's really <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. My name is Samantha McCann. I am the Vice President of Practice Change, uh, Journalist Practice Change at the Solutions Journalism Network. Uh, we are based in New York and have been around for about six years and are really happy that the practice of solutions journalism has, um, has kind of spread so quickly outside of uh, the U.S. borders and we can have this panel on solutions journalism in Europe. Um, so I'm here with esteemed uh, colleagues and friends and we'll be talking about um, kind of uh, what solutions journalism actually looks like at, in their different countries and their different publications um, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So the Solutions Journalism Network is a nonprofit organization based in New York City. Uh, we were founded in 2010, uh, 2013 by veteran journalists David Bornstein and Tina Rosenberg. Uh, they had been co-reporting a column, a Solutions Journalism column in the New York Times called Fixes, and we're getting such a good response to it that um, they decided to kind of form this methodology about how, how you actually rigorously report on responses to problems. Not just kind of the fluff pieces, not PR, not the advocacy, but what does rigor look like when you're reporting on how people are responding to problems and how can uh, we how can we encourage and train journalists to do this kind of reporting? Something that is essential to balancing the news and kind of the front page, the lead story on the nightly news that we see, which is usually pretty, um, pretty devastating. It's pretty problem focused, focused on corruption and how broken things are. Solutions journalism is meant to balance that picture and to show kind of the totality of what is happening uh, so that we might learn from success stories. So we uh, do quite a, quite a few things at Solutions Journalism. Uh, we have newsroom partners, about 150 throughout the US. Uh, we have a lot of resources on our website, solutionsjournalism.org. Uh, we offer events, community building, journalism school curriculum, um, anything you wanna know about, it's there. This is just a small sampling of the newsrooms that we work with in the US. So there are about 155 partners. Um, it's across the spectrum. So it's video, it's radio, broadcast, uh, legacy papers, small digital outlets. Um, really, they're, they're doing this, outlets are doing this in many different forms. Uh, and we're excited to see uh, how, it's, how it's spreading. So that's just a quick glance at, at our reach in the US. The dots are newsrooms. Many of them are concentrated in the big cities, so it just looks like one, but it is, it is many. Uh, those, those partners and others have contributed um, many of these almost 6,000 solutions journalism stories that we have captured in a database called the Solution Story Tracker. Uh, this is our pride and joy. Um, Every story is read, listened to, or watched by a team of taggers that makes sure it meets the four criteria of solutions journalism, that it includes evidence of how this is working, that it includes limitations of why this solution, where it's falling short, maybe it's really expensive. We think those things are absolutely essential to include in these stories so that other people can learn from them. Uh, that's just a quick glance of what the world looks like from the solutions perspective and click on each one of those numbers and it digs down even deeper on any issue you can imagine to get a story like this. So this is local here in Italy. As the earthquake rattles Italy, lessons in how and how not to rebuild cities and towns. So it's, it's, a, it's really exciting to play with um, and there are many possibilities, but I encourage you to go visit that. So of these 6,000 stories, um, that we've come across, and keep in mind this doesn't capture everything, this is just what we are able to kind of t tackle and to manage. Um, we've seen really amazing stuff. So the poverty puzzle was a year-long investigation into uh, income inequality in a town in the south in the United States. It was a year-long investigation into how different organizations and groups were responding to those problems uh, and what we might learn from them. And it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. The editor said that they've uh, never seen a response like this from the audience. The journalist said she couldn't believe the civility of the comments on Facebook, which I don't think is something that's ever been said in the history of Facebook before, uh, which is <laughs> powerful. Um, these are stories that do well on social. 
This, was, uh, this is a video that accompanied a fixes piece that Tina Rosenberg, SJN co-founder, reported. And this video was the most well-performing video on social in 2017. I've also seen other stories. Uh, there was a video, a World Hacks video from BBC that was one of their best, um, most shared videos on, um, on social as well in 2018. These are stories that lead to fundraising successes. We've seen many organizations successfully reach, um, attain sponsors that want to be associated with solutions content, um, raising money directly from local funders, like in this example. So the Richland Source is a small digital outlet. They have maybe four or five reporting staff, and they reached out to businesses who had never given to journalism before, and they said, we want to do solutions journalism. This is who we want to be in the community, and they were able to raise $70,000. We've seen solutions-oriented collaboratives really take off. Um, if there are two things that solutions journalism connects well with, it's engagement opportunities, bringing people together around solutions and talking about how we might move forward, as well as collaboratives. So this is in Philadelphia. Um, almost 20 newsrooms came together, this was two years ago, to co, um, not co-report, but to uh, report on the issue of re-entry. So there's an over-representation in the city of Philadelphia, and we had radio stations and legacy outlets and digital publications saying, how might we tackle this um, over the course of a year, and how what, might we move this issue forward? So outside of the U.S. Uh, boundaries, we have seen solutions journalism really take off here in Europe. The BBC has at least three different series featuring solutions journalism stories. So My Perfect Country is a beautiful, perfect example of solutions journalism. They look at what a country does really well. So they said, in my perfect country, um, I would have the disaster preparedness uh, approach in Cuba and what can we learn from them and then 30 minutes of investigating why it works and what other countries might learn from it. They also have a series called World Hacks, which I just learned this morning. I think they have renamed People Fixing the World. But these are shorter videos that perform very well on social, of just how we might learn from each other and what is working. <laughs> the Guardian has a series called Upside. Uh, and this is, they don't have a dedicated reporting team at Upside. It's, the reporting is shared across the organization. But they've, they've really seen um, an increase in, in audience metrics and audiences responding well to these stories. Uh, this was a fabulous um, multimedia story about how the Democratic Republic of Congo had essentially um, stopped sleeping sickness, where it was a very big problem, and how exactly step by step how they did it with beautiful visuals and kind of moving images. Uh, another English language example is apolitical. This is actually a network of policymakers, of government officials who are interested in learning from what other governments are doing. They also have a reporting team and they report out those stories. So here's what we learned from how Australia takes the bias out of hiring and then they share that with a network and it's, it's a, I'm constantly impressed by the, the stories coming out of apolitical. So outside of English language, which I admit we Americans are limited by, um, we have seen the basic toolkit, which is our kind of our core resource. This is everything you need to know about how to do this, translated into about 11 different languages with two more to come. And uh, we have some champions here who have actually sponsored those translations. So into Czech, Polish, Romanian, Russian, um, and all the other languages you see up there. So if you are interested and, uh, and want to figure it out in your own language, there are some, some great um, examples here of, of solutions journalism. So I'm now going to pass it off to Jeremy Drucker, who's the executive director of uh, Transitions Online in the Czech Republic. Okay, uh, thank you, Sam. So first of all, it's very gratifying to see how far we've come in just a year. Uh, Samantha and I were joking, last year we were in the basement here with no light <laughs> and about 15 or 20 people. So it's great to see that the, the concept is spreading and the, the interest. So maybe just, just to start off from the beginning, my organization is a publishing and training uh, nonprofit located in the Czech Republic, but we work throughout Central and Eastern Europe. We got hooked on solution journalism when one of the founders, David Bornstein, came to Prague about two years ago. And I think like many of us on the panel, we felt there was a huge need for this. There's a huge need everywhere in the world, but especially in Central and Eastern Europe where the distress in the media, the lack of civic engagement, uh, all of those types of issues are especially prominent, uh, partly because of the communist legacy, but just in general. 
So we felt there was really, it was a great time to introduce something new. But we had to really start from scratch. So I'm gonna just go through really quickly how we did that. Yeah. So um, we've had three pillars to the strategy, inspiration, training, and local production. So first of all, we've tried to bring some of the solutions journalism stars, uh, the people that helped establish the network, the people that run it now, in order to act as ambassadors. Uh, still in Central and Eastern Europe, it does matter to have people from the outside come in uh, who are real experts in, in this type of stuff. And, and actually, one thing we'll get into later when we talk about the challenges is there are no real local champions yet. It's, it's really starting, but there's still a need to bring in people to really explain it. There's also a Solutions Journalism Award, which has been running in the Czech Republic and recently in Slovakia the last couple of years. So this was a way to introduce it. There's quite a prestigious ceremony each year, something like the Czech Pulitzers, if you can call it that, where uh, the best journalism in those countries are awarded each year. So this was a way to introduce an award and use that opportunity to explain actually the, the concept to a wider audience. So providing training and tools, uh, Sam just mentioned that we've translated the toolkit into a whole bunch of languages, but generally what we do is, is bring someone in, give a lecture, introduce the concept, but then soon afterwards have a workshop where we really got people together, walk them through the process, how do you do the articles, what it is, what it isn't, and really get into some of the details. Discussing various examples, which again we'll talk about later, but so far most of the examples are still from the US. So that's something we're trying to change. And then supporting local production. So one thing we've introduced in all the countries is a, a series of micro grants. So journalists go to the workshops or hear about it in some way and then essentially pitch us a story with a budget. And this allows them to go out and, and do stories themselves when they might not yet have the support in their own editorial offices or if they're freelancers. And then what we've been also doing is providing mentoring. So very difficult for the first time that you do this to just get all the criteria right. Um, you can be the best journalist, but in many ways it's a different way of doing journalism or at least a different way of thinking. So it's helped very much to, to go through different drafts. And for a lot of journalists, I'll talk about one of the projects a little bit later, this is a very different concept, especially if you're working already in, in a publication to actually deal with someone outside providing input and advice who's not even part of your uh, publication. So that was also a, a way to, to um, have some influence within larger media organizations. Uh, but it's really been about building trust with the journalists that we can more or less know what we're talking about and that they're willing to show us a draft even though we don't even work with them and we're not an editor at their publication. So just one, a couple of couple of the examples. This is something which just uh, was a series of articles published over the last couple of weeks. It says Nasi Sam, which means you're not alone. It is a, a Czech uh, series of articles published in the Czech Republic about male suicide, which is a big problem as I learned across Europe, but also especially in the Czech Republic. Um, like, like many places, uh, women try to commit suicide as much as men or if not more, but men are often uh, more successful. This is an issue which was not very well known in the Czech Republic, so this is kind of a special case where we felt the first story had to actually describe the problem, and then the second, third, and fourth stories get into different solutions that are being used around the world to, to battle uh, male suicide. So one of the stories is from Japan, where barriers have put in uh, around, uh, I guess, metro stations and train tracks to prevent suicides in some of the, the most common places where that happens. And then one of the other articles is about male support groups and what works best. Because as the journals find out, found out in this particular case, it usually doesn't work well if someone just, especially in the Czech Republic, goes and has a beer with a friend to talk about their problems. It really works better to have these groups where it's total strangers, almost like Alcoholics Anonymous. So one of the, one of the stories was about that. This sparked uh, really great, great feedback from people um, high readership, it brought the issue to the agenda. And what the journalist said was before that, he was trying to interview people in the health ministry, they didn't want to talk to him. After the article came out, they called him and said, could you tell us a little bit more about these solutions that, that uh, you wrote about? So 
starting to have some influence at this point. Uh, another thing which was interesting is that one of my colleagues introduced them to Harkin, which is probably a lot of you have heard about, about increasing civic engagement. So they incorporate something into this production to allow readers to share their own stories back, um, family members who had committed suicide, how they had dealt with it and so on. They ended up getting, I think until today, about 150 submissions. So the journalist is working on a new series of article, articles about how people responded when uh, a family member, member committed suicide. So uh, we have some lessons learned. Uh, I think we'll get into this more during the discussion. But what was very uh, uh, inspiring was there are really, really good journalists that who are just tired of the status quo throughout Central and Eastern Europe. They really want to start um, new approaches and, and try to adopt new things. This doesn't only go for young people who are just starting out, but even some of the seasoned editors really believe uh, time is now for, for change. Uh, as I say here up on the slide, patience brings fruit. Uh, we really learned this is not going to happen overnight, especially as we talked about building trust with journalists, trying to get this into editorial offices. The long-term goal is obviously so that in every editorial office, someone at least stops and says, well, we're, we've been talking about the problem a lot. Now, now what about the solution? At least it's being discussed. We're really at the beginning of that. I mean, we now have, I would say, some stars or local people really interested in this, but it's still not incorporated into the majority of editorial rooms. Uh, and then, yeah, continuity is key. Really trying to build up a community around solutions journalism. Uh, definitely there are people that latch onto this early, get interested, are the leaders. But for it to really, again, uh, show bear fruit, you have to have a whole community that rally around the idea. So just looking forward, we're trying to deepen the concept in the Visegrad four countries, so Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland, giving out more stipends. Uh, Jakob Pierre will talk more about Poland, trying to spread the concept beyond in the Central and Eastern uh, Europe. So a couple of us were down in Romania, helping to get things started there. There's a project hopefully gonna start in Bulgaria, there's some stuff happening in Ukraine. Um, I've done some workshops in Moldova and in uh, Belarus, which is a completely different environment. Doing it in an authoritarian regime has its own challenges. Um, and then really measuring the impact. Even the, the story I mentioned before about male suicide, we're still a bit early to see uh, where the public discussion leads. But hopefully, as in the US, it will lead to greater civic engagement, people putting pressure on their uh, political leaders to actually do something after these stories come out. I think that's some of the skepticism we've heard is that, okay, the stories will come out, but like with everything, nothing will happen. So we really need those stories to show that yes, something did happen and it's worth, it's worth pursuing, as well as on the um, financial of the engagement side, to be able to convince editors that this does increase uh, the community around their own publications, engagement, and so on. So I think I better stop there. Okay, hi, okay, it works. Can I get the clicker? Okay, hello. My name is Jakub, Jakub Gornicki. I am based in Warsaw, Poland, and I have a pleasure to work with an amazing group of people on Outriders. We are a journalism startup, which was created and launched officially in September 2017. And we primarily work on two things. One is that we run Outrider.rs, which is a publication, online publication, which covers global topics which have local impact. And the second thing we do is Outriders Network, which is a knowledge sharing platform for other reporters and journalists. And uh, I think in December 2017 or January last year, 2018, we were approached by Ashoka Poland, who as an organization was looking for a, an ex execution partner to launch, um, to launch the Solution to Journalism project in Poland. And we immediately were like, hey, this is something what we wanted to do because um, we wanted to also, uh, I mean, Solution Journalism was for some time on our radar, and that was really a great opportunity um, for us to start it. And there's two reasons why we, uh, why we wanted to do it. One is very personal. We wanted our journalists who work with, in our newsroom and who cooperate with us to know how to do Solution Journalism stories and basically assess whether the story we are working on or thinking working on can have the solutions approach. And the other thing was that, um, you know, and I don't, I don't think this is very Poland specific, in many countries we see this situation, but our political um, debate is very polarized, it is very partisan, 
uh, and that touches also a lot of media, which basically creates this situation where one side is shouting at another, it's like, I'm right, no, I'm right, you know, I'm wrong, you're wrong. Uh, and that is very little room for actual debate. And we thought that, you know, solution journalism is actually a very good way to introduce a discussion you know, and really go into impact because impact is very much uh, embedded also into solutions journalism and that is something that we also found um, maybe not interesting but something very important basically to our job, you know. We think also that, you know, our job as journalists is basically rather binding societies rather than, what do you say, the binding, the binding disconnecting, you know. So at the end of the day, this is a very good platform basically to have a discussion. And that was basically our, let's, uh, our arrival into it, why we were so excited to work on it. And now Jeremy gave you an overview of how Transitions Online works in many countries. Here is a spe more specific overview of how we wanted to roll this out in Poland. So first of all, um, our idea was that we have to really um, focus on creating, uh, let's say, a, a set of showcase stories. And that was our first assumption when we sat down with, with Agata and Martina from Ashoka. To, to work on it. Um, the second thing we wanted to say, we were uh, discussing whether we should do open call to invite authors or we should do a closed call. A closed call meaning basically that we were approaching selected journalists and trying to uh, explain them more deeply the idea and we were trying to find authors who we thought would be more receptive um, to working with us on this, and this is basically the approach uh, we have taken, which is slightly different to what Jeremy does in other countries. And basically having that, so we, we take cool authors, we take, um, and we work with them on stories, create initial bans. But there was also other things which we've had um, planned. So this is basically how the last year looked for us, and actually, uh, so we started, okay, we sat down in January, as I said, and we've had, uh, we've had like the initial kickoff uh, series of meetings, uh, which, were, uh, which were led by David Boardman here. Um, so uh, if you want to start solution journalism in your country, David loves uh, uh, launching those solution journalism programs. Um, um, so David uh, came into Poland and for, we've, the, he had, um, meetings with various stakeholders, so publishers, uh, newsrooms, um, universities, and uh, we've also had um, um, an open meeting, so like everybody could come and the idea was uh, presented. And then a month after it, in the middle we've had Perugia, because actually last year we were flying together to Poland. We've had an actual kickoff workshop and that was in April last year. So we had um, two, let's say, two workshops. Uh, no, we had one workshop which was uh, done for the people who were selected for the project, our team, and let's say invited journalists, and then we've had a, an open workshop for, uh, for anybody to come in. So the idea be, be, like between closed call and open call, that is always a long debate because closed call is something where we can actually invite people, but an open call gives you this serendipity chance. You don't know who may react posi positively to the message, and just having open meetings creates a buzz, people come, they are interested, they may ask questions, and we find people who we, I don't know, we haven't mapped it before or something like this. And then we moved uh, further in around May or beginning of June, we launched Toolkit in Polish, um, which uh, Samantha was mentioning before. We've had the first story launched uh, in, in June, and uh, I'll, I'll show you this in a second. And then we've had another, uh, we just moved on, a second story, we've had a big conference in Warsaw end of September, which was followed by the workshop. We've also had a fundraising breakfast, so something where, um, uh, where Tina Rosenberg also came because she spoke at the event. And then we've also organized uh, a breakfast for other organizations, for um, uh, even business people who may find that uh, the idea is worth, uh, well, simply funding. And that actually worked quite well because one of the things we are working on currently is, to, I mean, especially Ashoka, they are leaning this way, is that establishing a fund, a specific fund just for solution journalism stories. And then in October, we, after the workshop, um, in September, we've had an open call to, um, to generate another story. And then we just go on and work on stories. And here we are um, um, in Perugia one more time. So just to give you more, um, 
so last year, we were like in 12 months ago, we've had nothing. We, just, we were just after David's uh, visit, uh, which was like two or three, three weeks before last year's Perugia. And so we've had three workshops, two open meetings, one fundraising breakfast. We have six stories in total. And that is something really cool. We started to see solution-ish, as I call it, stories uh, being born. So, you know, we, we push. And if you look at the timeline, we try to have um, a buzzy thing every three months. So whether it's a workshop, whether it's an event, whether it's a, a solution journalism network, uh, a team member flying in, or whether we start something that the solutions journalism pops up, that it doesn't, that people see who observe this as a new thing, whether, and they are like, oh, is it this, it's just a, a season fashion or an actual trend? Uh, so um, we just try to um, keep, the, keep the attention. And by solution-ish, I mean that we start to see more stories which if they had l extra work done, they would be a proper solutions journalism stories but they already start to have this solution angle in it more. So just go uh, quickly through four, four showcase stories. So this is a story done by my colleague Rafael Hetman, who is there. Uh, this is a story about basically how cities are solving the problem of having too many tourists. So if people of Perugia are fed up with thousands of journalists uh, crowding the city, this is the story where you find a solution uh, to it. Uh, the other story, which comes from our first micro grant, it's and here. Um, uh, so, and do you know what are uppers? Um, or Grzegorz, what was the other English word for it? Designer drugs? Yeah, or, highs. or highs? Yeah, legal highs? Legal highs. Do you know what's that? So we have drugs which we know, and then there are those legal highs which their um, ingredients change rapidly. They are. Um, responsible for many actually deaths. In Poland, the situation is that there was a huge government crackdown on it a couple years back, but basically we had lots of shops on the streets and that all, all of that sales moved to online. So it also, um, and the problem stayed. It was, just, it was just not that visible that if you were walking to a grocery shop, you would you know, pass by a shop which, where you could buy the uppers. Let's switch to this name. So Kacper from Gazeta Wyborcza, from the Warsaw edition, he did a huge story which, were, which went both in print and uh, online, basically, and he analyzed in Poland and in other countries how that issue is solved. And you may find some solutions to it quite in intriguing. Um, the, other the other story, uh, which is a, a huge deal, especially, especially in Poland, but also very specific to post-communist and post-Soviet countries, which is the ownership of various old buildings, and basically uh, which um, were the owners had them before the Second World War, and because of lack of dealing this in the communist times, it is a big issue right now, that lots of those buildings are given back to people who have, let's say, false claims to it, or you know, like you can prove that the aunt of your grand great-grandma maybe have owned it, and then boom, you get a nice building in the center of the capital. Um, and that is a big thing. So he was trying to see basically how that was solved in other, in other countries. And we had work, we had, help, we had supported those three stories out of six. This is a story which I'm really happy because it's a proper solution journalism story, which we had nothing to do with um, as a project. Um, uh, she basically analyzed uh, um, the, the, the problem is that um, basically how um, when you have domedziecka, uh, sorry, but there's a, a, my team orphanages, and uh, that they um, don't get that, 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 that child there don't have so much access to grown ups. And th one of the solutions measured here was actually that a merger of orphanages and elderly houses as a solution. So that was a story, and that story also went, uh, also went, very, um, went very viral. And uh, that's it from my side, because I had more slides, but we will be then asking during the questions. So here is the clicker. Thank you very much. I think I have mine. Hi. But does it work? OK. Uh, let's see. It doesn't. Uh, hi, I'm Sorana Stanescu uh, from Bucharest, um, and I first want to argue with Jeremy. Yes, last year you were in the ba basement with this session, uh, but it, it was, was a, a good basement. Uh, it was a good basement, <laughs> and it was a good crowd and the packed room. I know I was there in the back. Uh, so and we're grateful for any opportunity to talk about. <laughs> we want to be back into the basement. <laughs> 
So it's, it's definitely a long way that we at DOOR have come ourselves. Um, we, um, I, I started my, my uh, very short presentation with, with our mission, with our, our motto, with, which is we tell ourselves stories in order to live because this is what we have in mind uh, basically every day in the newsroom and when we uh, go out in the field. And um, we are an independent quarterly magazine. We started as an independent quarterly magazine in 2009, so we are just about to turn uh, 10 actually this month. Yeah, that's when the idea first came out. Um, and our plan was to, to cover modern day uh, Romania and to, to cover basically the stories that uh, stories and, and, and themes that concern people like us, us being 10 years younger as well, uh, in, a, in a country that was, uh, that was growing fast, that was developing, that, was, that had just uh, entered the EU, so we had the world at our feet, basically. Um, and our our main uh, our main aim was to to help our audiences connect uh, and and trust each other. Building trust again is a is a theme that just comes out so 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 often. Uh, and the way we plan to do this was uh, by uh, narrative storytelling. That was what we do best. We still do best, even though we've, we've grown a lot as an organization. Um, uh, but uh, we, as you, as you, uh, you will see later, we've kind of shifted the uh, gears a bit. Um, what we basically do now, uh, these are the the covers of our uh, issues in the past two years. Uh, we also have an online um, uh, publication that covers uh, with with daily coverage that covers uh, uh, public education. Uh, we have three podcasts, uh, and we do a lot of uh, quite quite a lot of uh, events. That is live storytelling events, uh, three four times a year for the past two years. We do, um, uh, and the main the, the main photo you see there that's from June last year. It, it's the biggest hall in the National Theatre in Bucharest, uh, nine hundred people. All our events are sold out in advance, which still is very humbling to us. And we also do um, a narrative um, uh, storytelling conference uh, at each October. It's called The Power of Storytelling. And we have uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, Emmy winners, Peabody um, uh, winners. And it's a huge, huge opportunity, uh, a professional opportunity, and we have, again, I think tens of, of attendees from outside Romania. People who don't know the magazine, who don't know us, but know about the conference. And that's, that's interesting to see how our brand grows and our organization develops. Briefly, our, our, our audience is, last year, we have roughly one, uh, 100,000 uh, page views every month. We have uh, we had 3,000 people attending our events last year, um, and a readership of uh, basically 16,000 um, uh, copies per issue. We we put out four issues a year, and our um, in in, two, in, uh, in uh, 5,500 copies. Uh, and 80% of, of, of our readers are subscribers of the print magazine, which is, yeah, which is quite high for, for a, a very um, shallow Romanian media uh, market. Um, now, going back to what we do today, uh, that, that, that picture there is not just a pretty picture. It's a picture we took last, last week, literally. Uh, it's in a village in northern uh, Romania. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we are now tweaking our mission a bit, uh, and that is we are uh, heading to, to more character-driven. We've always been character-driven, but now we are more, more focusing on solutions, so solutions-oriented stories and public-powered stories. We are also working with, with Harkin on three of our major um, verticals, um, and we've already started having people basically opening uh, uh, up our newsroom, our doors, our, our uh, editorial sessions, and having readers and, and people in the newsroom. So this is what we're um, moving forward right now, and the, editor the, the editorial bit, that's the pioneer of it all, 
is a, is a focus is focused on rural development. It's a bit that we just started uh, the beginning of uh, this year. We recruited a dedicated team. We'll uh, put out um, um, articles uh, every week, starting end of April. So everything's happening in April, apparently. Uh, and we will definitely, we ha when we go out to the field, we have the uh, public powered and solutions oriented um, mindset. We look for such stories. So that, that photo uh, there was just taken last week on our first pop-up newsroom in northern, uh, in rural northern um, Romania. Um, what we did so far, uh, apparently, yes, there are some models of starting solutions uh, uh, trends in uh, in Eastern Europe, and I think we are more like you guys in the Czech Republic, more like transitions. Literally, in, in January, we had David Boardman, the chair of Solutions Journalism Network, and Jeremy for a lecture and a workshop with journalists. We managed to uh, fundraise uh, for for this uh, series of uh, workshops lecture plus for uh, five uh, mini grants for stipends for journalists to cover solutions stories. Um, it's a it's twenty three. It was uh, twenty three thousand euros. It's not much, but it was enough for what we planned. And I must tell you, this was probably the easiest fundraising effort we've ever done. So apparently it, it is attractive for funders. It's easier to, to ask for, for money and convince funders and companies that solution stories are, uh, are a way forward. Of course, it didn't ha it, 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 what helped is that we have established relationships with certain companies, certain banks. Uh, there is trust between us. So it's not like starting from scratch, but it was still the easiest fundraising um, effort we've done. Uh, we just announced the first, uh, the winners, the five winners of the f first round of open, um, open uh, call applications, and we are going to start working with, with them closely uh, and and publish sometime in July. Quickly, um, what we know so far, uh, we are just starting. So I will be very honest. When when Samantha and Jeremy asked me to to be a part on this on this of this panel, I was, I said, but we haven't probably done solution stories. We've had solution niche stories. We've had solutions angles for sure. We've had very in impactful stories, um, but, but they said, no, it's it, okay. It's okay for you to be there. It's okay to, to, to see, to, to show how, how newsrooms are, can start a trend or a movement. Um, so what we what we know from the solution is ish stories that we we have done is that they do get uh, higher readerships, higher time on page, more shares, better reach. They definitely do very well on social media, and they have a longer lifespan. Um, people have always asked us, "What can okay? Your story was great. You made me care." That that, that character driven narrative storytelling approach we've always had that does make people care. But then uh, readers were asking, okay, that's great, but what can I do now? You've, you've like got me all excited about this issue. What can I do now? So had we, had we uh, used the solutions approach earlier or, and, and looked at the, the, the subject matter that way, probably we could have really answered better this question, what can I do now? Um, pitches, what we've learned from this, uh, from this open call session we just had is that pitches should be so, so very rigorously reported and documented and they should not be, be about the problem but about the, the, the solutions. Um, and they are not about future plans or good intentions and they are not about um, uh, campaigns because quite a few of the, st of the pitches we got were about so people got it that it's not that much about the problem anymore, nor about one person doing changing the world, but they th they went on, on on the path of campaigning and advocacy, and that's not solutions. So that's where we basically are right now. We're just starting, um, and yeah, we look forward to having soon uh, a few of our stories on the solutions tracker as well. Thank, Thank you, you. Saran. Uh, so, so there was something that every one of these panelists mentioned in their conversation. Uh, that solutions journalism was about moving the conversation forward. It's, solutions journalism is a way to introduce a discussion. Solutions journalism is about what can I do now. 
So we, you think about the places where solutions journalism really, uh, really works, and it's where there is a stuck conversation, where your newspaper, your community has been reporting on a problem for years, for decades. Um, and so, David Bornman, since, since you're here, uh, David was the editor of the Seattle Times, and that was actually our first partnership. It was what made us a legitimate organization working on this practice. And Seattle had had, uh, in, in Washington, in the northwest of the US, had a stuck conversation about public education. It was reporting on the problem, how bad it was, it was divisive, it was constant and pervasive. And David Boardman met David Bornstein, and they said, let's, you know, what is, let's try, to, let's try to move this conversation forward. And out of that came a series called Education Lab. It was supposed to be a one-year experiment, and it's now in its sixth or seventh year uh, of reporting on solutions. How can we move these conversations forward? What can we learn from what other places are doing? Um, and so I really appreciate that that is really still a part, a part of it. What do you do after you know that something's a problem? You can't just keep reporting on it. Where can we look to? Um, I also noticed, so um, Jakob, you said there are six stories, six solution stories in Poland, in Romania, not any yet. Not, that you know not, of. Not uh, that we are confident enough to qualify as a solution story because maybe we are being extra cautious right now, but since we are just starting, we are very um, careful about what we basically label a solution story because that will set a trend. That will, that will become a, a model and something journalists and other newsrooms will refer to. So right. we, if we get that wrong, right. ah, that's not good. So right. that's why we're careful. And Jeremy, how many stories have you guys seen in the Czech Republic? Th through, through the stipends, there are about three or four okay. um, by the spring, but then throughout the region, Slovakia and Hungary, I think we'll have about a dozen by, okay. by the fall. Okay, and, and so those numbers sound small, but I do not want you to think that that is not where we were six years ago when we started. The solutions journalism story, the solution story tracker that is now almost 6,000 stories, that started out as an Excel sheet that was 12 stories that we knew about, most of them from the Seattle Times. So this is a slow build and it's about establishing norms, um, new journalistic norms about how to report these and then all, something, something hits. Um, and and I, I can't wait for it to, to hit in Central Europe. Um, so I wanted to ask you all, uh, are, there, are there patterns about, that you're seeing in the institutions or individuals that are really attracted to this? So I know, I mean, Jakob, you're doing this just at Outriders, but are there, of the other organizations that you're working with, Jeremy in the Czech Republic, Sorana, are, who, is there like a personality type? Is there a specific kind of institution that is like, yes, that is for us? Yes, excuse me. In Romania, um, what has happened over the last, I'd say, 10 years or maybe eight years is that we've seen a decline in traditional media, mostly print media, but also 24-hour uh, news uh, TV media, and the rise of what we call independent media, that is small newsrooms, um, mostly doing uh, online. We are the only independent media outlet also uh, producing print uh, and doing so many things. All the others are more focused on, on, on the journalism uh, as it is. Uh, so I'd say the early adopters have always been the independent newsrooms in Romania, not so much the traditional newsrooms where because of the decline, because of the cut in pay, in people, in everything that can be cut, was cut, Y th that, that's a struggle for publication, for money, for funding, for keeping it alive. So it's, it's the independent media that's always been the early adopters. Great. Yeah, I would say more, more or less the same in, in Central Europe. The, the more progressive independent media seem to, to get it immediately. Um, so in the Czech Republic's rep respect is one, the the public, uh, what I showed you before was, it's called Actualnia, which is one of the bigger news sites. They're all in the same publishing house. Denik N, some of you might have heard about, which is in Slovakia, starting up, has started up in the Czech Republic. They tend to, to get it immediately, but also public media, um, obviously depending on the country. I mean, public media is very different in Hungary than in the Czech Republic, but um, Czech radio, for example, they're very much into it. They might be starting a new series now. 
So I think that in, in certain countries, that's a, a good venue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just going to add up to what Sorana was saying, that yes, when it comes to organizations, the smaller independent organizations are, of course, much more receptive to it because they are simply more flexible and they have to experiment to kind of survive and make their brand and so on. But the other thing is that when it comes to authors, journalists and so on, here um, we see that it's, we can get um, people from out, out of mainstream newsroom and they would be very much into working on a story which is an opportunity and a threat at the same time because um, uh, I don't f we don't have to spend so much time convincing journalists to, to do on it, but maybe we have to add extra time basically to talk to his editor or a person who makes a decision. In a so this is basically what creates an obstacle within bigger organizations where they have you know, established formats, established ways of producing stories, um, time span which they give to the authors. So here it is. So when it comes to strictly to the journalists, um, I wouldn't see, differentiate, to be honest, that much, uh, at least when it comes to the will, you know, like, so. Or, or uh, the context in which journalists operate in, yeah, okay. Um, Jeremy, I have a question for you. I'm, I'm wondering, you're working in so many countries throughout Central Europe, is there a bright spot? That's the analysis we often take Poland. in. <laughs> That's <laughs> the analysis we always say is who's doing it better. So of, the, of all the countries that you're working in, besides Poland, or <laughs> maybe it is Poland, who, who, where has this really picked up um, more easily than the other countries? I think we're still really too early to say. That's my diplomatic answer. So, um, I mean, we've seen certain examples in each country, but I, I would say Dave, when David and I were down in Romania, even though I know we're at an early stage, I think we were both really surprised at just the interest. There was a huge turnout at the event there, and so many people, even the questions we got from the audience were somehow at a different, more advanced level. So it did seem like the community was very ready for that and just, I think, um, yeah. I mean, the level, that somehow was different from the, some of the other public events we've had in some other countries. You're okay with that? Okay. <laughs> um, so f for all of you, what, what, if anything, is is distinct about the European context that makes it that makes it different from the American journalistic context in terms of what the role of a journalist is or or challenges you're finding in actually, you know, making solutions journalism be taken up. I have a short and quick answer. I'd say at least for Romania more competition would help because when you have a strong competition uh, and when you fight not, not only for funding but also for attention and readership then you're more keen on working harder uh, being more aware of, of the trend and what's going on in the world and and what we should could do better and more whereas because I mentioned the shallow media landscape earlier, when it is shallow and you are already on top, it's quite easy to become self-sufficient or at least not be in such a hurry to adopt and do and and change and 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 look other way, uh, yeah, other direction as well. So, um, what we could have done differently was definitely adopt uh, solutions journalism earlier and look that way earlier, we would have been in a better place right now. Uh, but also, we could have, because of we've had solutions angles, but because of our very focused uh, narrative storytelling angle, we were keen on um, portraying the, the character, the, the people doing this, or the community doing this, not so much the process and the what, the what works and the limitations of what actually works. So yeah, we were quite, a bit self self confident maybe that we are doing our best and yeah this is the best we can get in Romania but the moment blah 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 but well that's changed so competition, competition. Like I'd say yeah okay It's just a quick question. I, you know, for context, it'd be interesting to hear like the size of your yeah. newsroom. Yeah. Well, right that. now we are 25, but that doesn't mean 25 
uh, journalists. That means also support admin fundraising, uh, communications, art direction. We are, I think, a crowd of maybe uh, 10 people writing, 10 journalists. We do, we work a lot with freelancers as well. We have long established relationship with, with freelancers. But yeah, the size also matters. We've grown a lot in the past 18 months. We've not always been 25. We started with a team of four and then it went up and down. But now we are at the highest level we've ever been on all levels. And in terms of the, the size of organizations where solutions journalism tends to thrive, it, there, there is no normal. We've seen anything from two and three people doing this, like Richland Source is a really small newsroom, to New York Times, to the BBC. So it, it you know, it, it of course, as Jakob said, is easier if you are more nimble and smaller and have less kind of institutional pressure to do a certain kind of reporting. Um, but I, I want to build on what you said, Serena. Uh, what, for, for <laughs> three, eight people? No, I'm just replying. This is 13 in total, uh, seven or eight journalists. So. Um, what, so for anyone in the audience interested in kind of launching their own solutions journalism network, whether within their own institution or the very bold countrywide change, um, what, what challenges have you faced and what would you do differently next time? More funding. <laughs> <laughs> No, so uh, basically we've had two main challenges. Uh, one is that, let's say, existing um, way of doing journalism, uh, which is more emotional, very very much news-oriented, and uh, kind of this uh, shouty style, uh, which is very not solutions-oriented. And basically when we go with solutions, um, um, it, it also demands a lot of uh, practice, uh, rather than like, uh, because in essence, I wouldn't say it's very, hard to understand it, but then you have to really go into details and try to understand all of the four important factors of basically how, how to do it. So that is um, one thing. So we are basically changing sometimes the culture of doing stories, which might be a big thing. And that translates to the second obstacle, which is um, we initially talked to only authors, but after a couple months we realized we have to take everybody on board. So even if, let's say, you would win a micro grant from us. We have to take everybody who is in your decision process to run the story before that grant is finally approved so that everybody's on the same side. Because that, because we go to the existing culture then, we, 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 we had sometimes ideas of editors like this is a great story, but what if we would cut out the solution part of it uh, <laughs> to make it more dramatic, you know? Um, so we're like, no, 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 you know? So here, we as an external organization, we go into someone's existing editorial process. So once we have that meeting at the beginning of the cooperation, that basically, our success factor is 99%, so that everybody's on board, and that we are not there to like do orthography check and go into their like culture of writing and so on, but we do have to somewhat protect the spirit, you know? So. And that, those are, the, those are, I would say, those two really big factors, which is really important, uh, and were for us uh, a kind of a struggle in the beginning. Um, just one quick, quick addendum. Uh, some of the resources we have on our website, there's a link there, uh, but there's an editor's toolkit. It's like if you're an editor, how do you spread this throughout your newsroom? What do you need to keep in mind? How to get your reporters on board? And simultaneously, there's the from the opposite view. If you're a d reporter working within a newsroom context, how to tell your editor that this isn't PR advocacy, but just kind of rigorous journalism. So there's a lot of resources up there. Yeah, so I guess we're running out of time, but just very quickly, some of the obstacles, I guess I already mentioned it, but it will really help once we have more examples from the region to use when we do the workshops. So Sam mentioned a couple of the examples in the US. Those are all very powerful. It's been very, very helpful, especially having David participate in workshops as an experienced investigative journalist, because one of the things we often hear, I think this is probably universal, is that this is too much like advocacy uh, and so on. So to have someone established who has Pulitzer Prizes behind him and so on, that really helps. Uh, but we still need more examples, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, the way media development worked. There were so many Americans coming in and saying like, this is how we do it back 
in America, um, there's still a legacy of people being tired of that to some extent. Some people are still inspired, but others are like, yeah, we heard about this before, but it's never gonna work here. So it really helps to have those, those local examples. I think for what doing differently, probably giving more advice on how to pitch the stories, at least for the stipends, because too often it's been mentioned a couple times, people get fixated on a problem and they really want to solve that problem, but they don't do enough homework about solutions somewhere. They kind of have a feeling there's probably a solution out there, but they're pitching us more the problem and not having done their homework about the, the solution. Yeah, pitching, I'd say, is also is, is, is crucial. Uh, because we've we've done we've given out stipends before, and we know that the written application is one thing, and it may sound all good and fluffy and nice on the paper, but when you sit down with the journalist, uh, looks uh, things can be a bit different. So what we had was a, a second stage, uh, selection stage, and that was a phone interview basically, and we definitely asked the very specific question: Who have you talked to? when applying for this, uh, for this um, grant. How fresh is the information? What's the name of the place you say this is happening and, and how? And su surprise, surprise, I think two, at least two of the best uh, written applications proved out not to be thoroughly researched uh, and they were, they were yeah, um, taken out of the, of the process. So rigorous reporting when pitching and rigorous selection of, of on the editor's side as well. Okay, So I'm hearing uh, more training in actually how to pitch these stories and framing them. Um, I'm hearing a kind of influencer, the, the importance of influencers in, in lending credibility to the practice. Uh, and Jakob said... Poland is the best. Poland is the best. I, I would also say it, it's really important to emphasize to people that these solutions are not always big, grand solutions. They might be on a very local level. And that's also one message that we've been trying to drive through. When I gave a workshop in Moldova, also one of the things at the very beginning was like, this is Moldova, there are no solutions here. You know, which is very depressing, you know, very depressing to hear. But then we tried to drill down and say, look, it might be a local mayor or a hospital or a school doing something different. And, and that helped a lot. That's great. So we have about three minutes for questions. I'm sorry that there's not more time, but d are there any questions we can start with? Hi. My name is Emma Howard. I work for Unearthed, which is an investigative news platform at based at Greenpeace. Um, so I spend a lot of time looking at baddies and on a kind of pretty depressing topic. Um, and so I'm sort of really interested in this stuff. My main problem, I think, would be we don't really measure in clicks, we measure in like real world impact. And I feel like solutions journalism is often kind of seen as being the soft option or being like a feature, not a news story. And so do you have any thoughts or examples on how you demonstrate that these stories can have real world, real world impact? We have a ton. Um, the whole story dot solutionsjournalism dot org is our blog. We have an entire section on impact case studies, uh, uh, impact that's happened in Seattle from Education Lab, from the Cleveland Plain Dealer changing policy, changing conversations that had been stuck for a decade after just shifting the frame. Uh, there, we've seen a lot, and in terms of um, audience kind of analytics and clicks and the other kind of less powerful impact, um, that is there as well. Some, a constant that we've seen is uh, on, how journalism, um, on how audiences respond to solutions journalism is that it increases people's sense of agency. They feel that something can be done about a problem and that they can do something about a problem. And you think about you know, how, how kind of models are changing away from subscriptions and, and sponsorships but, and members. You, you have members coming back and saying, I want more of that. I am, you know, I, this is content I can connect with. David? Okay. All right. When, can I just say one thing? So everything that we're doing um, and being done in all these countries would, would not be possible without the support of the Solutions Journalism Network. I just want to mention that because it didn't have to be that we would get so much support um, that we have from New York. So I know you don't always have the capacity with us. <clears throat> Uh, have to kind of push and, and pull and try to probably ask too much 
um, but we do all appreciate that. So we thank love you. coming to Prague. Right, thank you so much. Uh, Doesn't matter. Probably no one wrote it down. No, no, no. It, that doesn't work.